Dr. Max Sinatter is my guest. He is a professor of ophthalmology who studies and scans our brains, its mysteries, how we are wired, and what happens when there is a disconnect from a bump on the head or a genetic defect, or maybe gender, I don't know. Male, female, dare you go here? Male, female brain different? They are different, for sure. You know, male brains are bigger, you know that, surely. <laughs> You think? Oh, they're about Does 10 that make you bigger. smarter? <laughs> they're bigger, or are they better? Well, they're about 10 percent bigger. Let's just okay. leave it at that. Okay. Uh, actually, there have been studies about the connectivity between uh, uh, female and male brains, um, and uh, you know, I found it a little puzzling. But I'll just tell you, you know, don't shoot the messenger. Right. <laughs> the, uh, the results were. Uh, that the male brain seemed to have stronger connections within each hemisphere. Right. And the female brain seemed to have many more connections across the corpus callosum, which is the band of fibers connecting the two hemispheres. It seemed like the female brain was more likely to engage both hemispheres at the same time during the same task. Okay. And the male tended to be more specialized. Uh, so if you studied a cave man and a cave woman, in the ancient times, uh, she multitasks better than he does. He he goes you know, out and shoots the dinner, <laughs> or what? You know, I, Is I'm that not, a natural know, thing? I have to admit, I don't know exactly what the consequences of this uh -huh. finding are. But you know, the other question you have to ask about women is. Uh, you know, it's going to be different at various times in their uh, menstrual cycle. It's going to be different uh, in postmenopausal women than it is, uh, you know, in uh, women who, sure. are, who are fertile. In fact, it's quite a problem uh, in uh, neuroscience uh, uh, because a lot of research is done on males. So uh, we have a big project going on in stroke, and it's being done, you know, on rats. Yes. We use exclusively male rats. And uh, uh, the research done on males, white males? More white males well, than white male rats. other, yeah, that's other ethnic. No, I mean, you know how sometimes science weighs towards the white person sure. as opposed to the rest of sure. the Absolutely. culture. Well, I think um, uh, you know, I, th I think that will depend on where you are. Sure, you know, if there's if you're doing scans mm -hmm. in China, there will be yes. Chinese. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, the great news is that uh, neuroscience is advancing all over the world. So I actually uh, personally now have a cross appointment at the Beijing Institute of Brain Disorders. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor there. Really? Yeah, they don't pay me or anything like no. that, but I, I get to go uh, a couple of times a year. And it's remarkable to see how quickly they're moving and how fast they're learning and how excited they are to, you know, to come across these questions they're going to have a tremendous problem with aging society and dementia because their society is going to get old uh, in a very dramatic way. They're going to be like Japan in 25 years. A uh, rumor has it uh, you are retiring from the brain center. From what part of the brain center? Sure. Well, I'm uh, as of now, I'm uh, still director of the Brain Research Center and the Jabad Moafagian Center for Brain Health. Uh, uh, next month, I'm going to be stepping down from my administrative responsibilities, but uh -huh. only my administrative responsibilities. And uh, you know, from from my point of view, it's actually a very exciting opportunity because what I'm going to do next is uh, I'm going to cure diseases. <laughs> Great. Which you might be thinking, why hasn't he been doing that for the last I know. 30 years? What's he been doing all this time? And what? when you say, I'm going to cure diseases, diseases. what diseases? How? Well, um, uh, I've, uh, I'm going to go back and uh, be a research scientist, and I've mm -hmm. got a lab of about 20 people, and we're all making revolutionary discoveries and uh, pushing things forward. Uh, but I'm also co-founder of a new biotechnology company called Primary Peptides, along with Yu Tian Wang and William Jia. And We've developed this amazing technology that we think just has multiple uses. It's basically a way to figure out where any two proteins kiss each other. And once you know where they kiss, we can, like, you know, they're very complicated in shape. They look sort of like this. So we can figure out, but they only kiss here, right there. And once you know this, these two spots, you can make blockers, and we can prevent them from kissing each other. So we have, for instance, a uh, peptide, a little peptide that blocks Which that. Which is a what? A peptide? It's just a few amino acids. OK. All proteins are made of amino acids. So a typical protein has the 500 amino acids. Peptide is like eight amino acids. Mm -hmm. Just this little kissing point. 
you drop this peptide into the soup, <laughs> give it intravenously, you can save 90% of the brain cells that would otherwise die following a stroke. Really? Yeah. So it's and do you have to do it quickly? Six hours. Six hours. Which is actually a pretty so good that's time. that's major. It's pretty good time, absolutely. We have another one that we're working on uh, that we think is going to be a tremendous treatment for Parkinson's. Um, we have and we have some slightly more whimsical ones. Uh, we've got one that we're working on for jet lag. Jet lag. Yeah, we think we can. That'll be a major seller. Are you going public? <laughs> <laughs> I'm buying the stock. Well, we're working on all these things. Okay. So, you know, it's a challenge to get them uh, to the consumer. But you know, Fanny, the field of neuroscience is it's just it is just unbelievable what is happening. I think that you really ain't seen nothing yet. You know, the field is becoming more visible, I think, in the eyes of the public. But I think we are in the very early innings of the revolution in brain health. I think we are going to see, you know, primary peptides is my particular venture, but I think there are, there are many other brilliant scientists in Vancouver and across the world thinking about these things, coming up with new strategies and treatments. I think you're gonna see treatments for the major brain diseases in the next decade. I think you're going to see new diagnostics. I think you're, you know, like, talk about concussion. I think it's gonna be a very short time before we have a test that can be applied to an athlete on the field. And mm -hmm. we can say, okay, how bad was your bell <laughs> rung? Mm -hmm. uh, and should you go home or should you go back on the field? Or should you go back to play next week? You know, or, or, or should you stay home right. another week? I think we're gonna have new diagnostics. I think we're gonna have new treatments. And I think that you know, the future is actually incredibly bright. We are understanding so much more than we did just a few years ago. And that is being translated by a bunch of hungry, smart, eager scientists. Sure, but five years down the road, uh, when uh, we have children in grade two, uh, three, who have been immersed uh, in social media, cell phone land, watching TV from the time they're born, lots of stimulation. Good for them. Is it good for the brain, do you well, think? Well, you know, I think uh, there was a long uh, time when people thought, oh, playing video games is so uh -huh. bad for your brain. And maybe, but there's actually no strong evidence for that. Um, and in fact, there are some video games that now look as though they will help you. So, for instance, there's a video game uh, that people have uh, uh, developed in California. It's a driving simulator. And you give it to 65, 75-year-old people, old people, not like us, you know. Right. Uh, sure. And uh, what you find is that their driving improves. It's, you know, it's like a driving, you know, one of those drive around the racetrack games. Sure. Isn't that a, so well, guess what? It is fun. Yeah, it's fun so. and, and your driving improves. Um, there uh, is a, uh, you know, there are complex strategy games uh, that you can give people to play. And guess what? It improves their ability to plan ahead. Well, in the area of games, yeah. uh, bridge, chess, Yes, puzzles, yes, crosswords. all of the above. Why are they important? Do all those things and do them while you're running marathons. Okay. But <laughs> what about do your a, a brain you're... deficit in certain people, like say a spatial deficit? Uh, you can't find your way to Kelowna. Yeah. You can't find your way uptown. Yeah, there are What's going, going on, on in that. the brain? Smart, high IQ, Absolutely. have an area of the brain that just doesn't seem to work. Can't put a tinker toy together. Absolutely. Can't it, put Lego together. I, I, think it's, I think that's absolutely fascinating, and I think that's one of the things, one of the kinds of things that we're going to really break open in the next few years. So why is that? Because, you know, when they write the history of this period, Fanny, 500 years right. now, they're going to say this is the period, the year 2000 and a little after, is when they decoded the human genome. It is now to the point where you can go in and get your genome sequenced for a thousand bucks. That's you know, not a lot of money, no. and if you consider healthcare costs. Uh -huh. And the first human genome, when they sequence that, it's not very useful. It's like the first fax machine. Right. <laughs> but as we get more and more human genomes, we start to look at, uh, you know, the thousands and thousands of genomes and the variants among them. And we start to put that together with, 
you know, what, are, what is the genetic variation that leads to a poor sense of direction? Right. What is the genetic variation that lets somebody think on their feet? Sure. Uh, what is the genetic variation, you know, that gives somebody perfect pitch? What is the genetic variation that gives somebody terrific visual motor coordination? All of this is going to be modified by your experience, especially your early experience. But the predilections are going to be there in your genome and we're going to have that kind of information for more and more and more people. Okay, and the importance of human connection in all of this. We well, have connection to technology, but connection to each other. How important? It's critical. It's critical. Your emotional, the emotional parts of your brain won't develop properly unless you can make firm attachments, particularly early in life. And that's why, you know, one of the things I tell people is Stay married, mm. you know, uh, keep your, try to create the best possible environment you can uh, well, stay for your married children. Stay married have a hot lover. Or both. <laughs> or both. <laughs> That's for another well, show, another well, day. Try to find, mm -hmm. you know, try to, f you know, look after your kids. I mean, sure. it is your I responsibility. Everyone knows that. But it's really, really important for their brain. And not to be lonely uh, as you age. Uh, not to have friends, not to have that emotional, you've, that EQ, you, that you've, emotion. You've got to have that. You've got to have that. For, the, for your brain to be healthy. Absolutely. Absolutely. As well as doing puzzles. Anything else like well, running, you know, leaping, You know, what I tell weights. people is, uh, you know, it's all the things, again, it's all the things your mother told you to do. You know, eat your Wheaties, mm -hmm. eat a most, you know, what I tell people is eat all the different colors of the rainbow if you possibly sure. can. Eat mostly a plant-based diet if you can. Uh, eat less. Eat less because the only thing, the only way we know to actually extend life, and you know, none of the other things I'm talking about will actually extend your life. The only thing we know that will extend your life is to eat less. Okay, and can you have the odd cocktail? Sure. <laughs> okay, <laughs> not too much, everything in Everything in moderation. moderation. So my, my number is one glass of uh, wine per day. But another scientist in our center who drinks a little more than I do says uh, three is okay. Okay, well, I don't know who's right, but it's a pleasure to see you again. Very nice and to see you again, And congratulations on your sort of retirement uh, to your future. Thank you very much, Fanny. Thank you. Dr. Max Sinatter. And coming up, we meet a New York author, professor who writes a blog about beautiful minds. In his new book, which is called Ungifted, he redefines intelligence and explores the truth about talent, practice, creativity, and the many paths to greatness. Stay with us for Scott Barry Kaufman. He's a Yale grad who teachers once thought was a slow learner.